Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in again. Or if this is your first time, welcome. So I'm going to give some context for this beautiful conversation I just had with, with Daniel. Um, before I do that, I'm just here for some housekeeping. So a couple of things. Uh, regarding circling in the Circling Institute, there is, I'm going to be doing a demo circle on um, the 31st at, uh, on Zoom at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'll be for an hour and a half. And it's just going to be basically me circling somebody. And um, the, my other co-leaders will be there. And you can ask questions as I'm circling, right, about, about the process that's happening. Um, and they'll be back there answering your questions. And then we can, once the circle's over, we'll debrief it and talk about it and discuss it. So if you're interested in, um, in, in seeing explicit circling, on some level, if you've been watching my channel, I'm sure circling is you know, happening in, in these dialogues implicitly. But if you want to see an explicit circle, that's happening on Saturday. Um, also, we have every Thursday night, I'll give, you, I'll give you a link for everything below. So every Thursday night uh, from six Pacific Standard Time to nine, six to nine, there's open to the public, it's on Zoom. So anybody's welcome. You can find links for that below. If we have a weekend coming up in about, I think five weeks or so, that's open to everybody. And we are taking um, enrollment for the next Art of Circling. The, this one just sold out and we, and it's the time is you can't you can't register for it anymore and so and it's overbooked basically so um we're going to be doing another one i think it's in about like five or six months so um if you're interested in that you probably want to sign up as early as possible because um things are thing people seem to be really interested in in circling and uh our <laughs> Our ability to grow to the interest is um, is challenging. So, anyways, okay. So, I think. Oh, and if you're interested in doing one-on-one -on -one work with with me, I am currently taking clients. Um, uh, email me. My email is below. Okay. So, context for this conversation. So we talked about. So Daniel. Um, He's, he's from Australia, I believe he's been um, doing work abroad in Japan and has been a, a study, uh, a student of the Kyoto School, which is the, um, the Japanese school of philosophy, who have, uh, I think their main influence was through uh, the continental form of philosophy with Heidegger and, and, um, and the German, like a lot of the German philosophers. And they really start to, they, you, you see them start to like bring in, in their philosophy, bring in the notion of emptiness or sunyata. And so we talk, Daniel and I talk a lot about, a lot about Nishitani's work, who wrote a book called um, Being and Nothingness, which is just a profound book. And it, it addresses a lot, has a lot to do with nihilism and emptiness. Um, and we also, uh, and, 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 and essentially what we we're also talking about is like, what is the difference? Or where does something like genuine dialogue, authentic dialogue, what does it arise from and what holds it? What are the conditions of its possibility? And we were proposing that most conversations the conditions of the possibility is a narrative of some kind, right? What holds it together is a, some kind of narrative that we're inside of or we're creating or we're sustaining. And what would happen if we looked at a conversation that arised out of sunyata, out of emptiness? And so that was kind of the dialectic, I'd say, that, that um, this dialogue really embodied and deepened. And we talked a lot about love and we talked a lot about um, 
becoming a person in some sense, something that happens to us, right? We happen to ourselves. We'll talk a lot about that. He's a really beautiful guy. Really, I'm really enjoying get to, getting to know him. I think you'll, you'll see a, an, an affinity in the conversation that, it, that um, I know the first conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago, listening to it again for me, it was just, it was ecstatic. So, and uh, I, I have a feeling this conversation when I listen to this one again, maybe be even more so. All right, please share if you're interested in. Also click the, you can uh, uh, subscribe if you want to get all the notifications for when new, new conversations are coming out, which there are many. I'm having another dialogue with Chris. Um, where we go, where we read Heidegger. We keep, Chris and I keep scheduling to read Heidegger and then we end up talking for four hours and then we're so exhausted just, <laughs> we never start reading. So I think we're just gonna start reading this time. Um, and uh, another one with John on Wednesday and then uh, three way with Chris and John. And then we have another four way with, with John, Chris and um, Jordan in the midst where we really kind of take this notion of sinyata and emptiness and dialogos and we're gonna riff on it together. So all that's coming down the pike. Enjoy. There you go, good. Welcome back, Daniel. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm really, um, um, Looking forward to us talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about the last conversation because the uh, we met we met at we met at um, the Hokiam. Is that is that how you spell it? The Hokiam. 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 My dyslexic speaking. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, of Johannes's the, the the guild that Johannes's start, and so we we met. Right, and so I was like, I think I we I want to talk with you more about about the thing with Nishitani and Heidegger and and stuff. And so then we just had this first conversation, and I really just enjoyed it. I even like I was I was talking about it when I when I listened to it again. I was like, I got a little intoxicated or something. Right? There's kind of a sense of where, and I think I th and this is, and I'm just. This, uh, this thing about dialogue, right? Especially these, a certain kind of philosophical intimacy. I experience this as a, like a philosophical intimacy. On one level, it's like an intimacy with the person that you're talking with. But there's, a, there's this other component of intimacy, which is where it's almost like it's this there's a, uh, like all intimacy involves a kind of vulnerability or a nakedness. And I was thinking about mm -hmm. like, it seemed like the nakedness was kind of something like having new thoughts together, right? And not knowing what the thoughts were gonna be, right? And having them impact things in all kinds of different ways. And this, is, this has been part of the project um that's just is kind of formed on its own with with like people like John Verveke and Christopher and you know a lot of the people I've been talking to on the channel and then it's then it's uh it's it's kind of formed itself into a, a book that's going to be published I just got done writing a chapter for us that was the thing I sent to you called Internet or Dialogos and it's and it's basically about really looking at this phenomena, this phenomena of dialogue or, or more precisely philosophical dialectic when it, when it transcends the dialectic and moves into dialogos, where it's that moment of like, when you imagine something like with the, with the dialect, the traditional dialectic is where if you imagine like the fire, it's like the logs are the propositions, right? And then the dialogue, right? When you start the dialectic, the act of the dialectic or the dialogue is the starting to kind of rub sticks and 
And at some point, something emerges and the, the, the logos, the symbol of the logos has always been fire. And then something lights. And that's where you end up, you know, with this kind of a, something gets created greater than the sum of the two, the, the sum of the logs, right? It's, it's transformative in that sense. And mm -hmm. I mean, John's been really keying in on this, on, on this with his, especially with his background as a cognitive scientist, right? And him, you know, where he's kind of talked a lot about so, so he, he's, he comes with already like a set of questions inside of him that he's been working on for years, which is, has to do with the meaning project. It has to do with this, what he calls reverse engineering enlightenment, right? And both East and West, right? And, and in some sense, kind of filtering out or not even filtering out, but, but revealing, um, you could say, the metaphysics of that, right, or the ontology of, of those things that used to give us meaning that we don't believe in anymore, or it's hard to believe in. And he's basically showing like, well, I don't even think anybody had to ever believe in that stuff in the first place. There is a, there's a logos to reality itself, right? And that these practices and platonicism and in, 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 in philosophy and dialogos and all of this exemplifies a, a meaning that we can find right in the primordiality of life, right? And so for mm. John's really been talking about like this sense of like he thought, he thinks that, I even thinks he may propose this, I'm not sure, I don't want, I don't want to misrepresent him here, but um, essentially that the dialogos, right, is kind of the culmination of essentially the culmination of enacting the fount of intelligibility, of the inexhaustible intelligibility. And that in some sense, the, the philosophical dialogue, right, when it goes to dialogos is a symbol and a kind of almost a ritual enactment of mm the revelation of that, that being is. And so that naturally kind of has gone into this other conversation, which is, that it's been forming, which is, okay, well, what is that? You know, and, and I, I, I think I started asking myself, well, okay, so in this, in this dialectic dialogue, dialogos, like what's the substance of it, right? What's it like? What's it, what's the medium of it, right? And 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 I had this talk with John, and he, he said like he thought it was rel relevance real, realization, and and now it's kind of more come into this sense of where the question I think that's that I'm sitting with, and that we're going to be kind of talking together here pretty soon about, which is what is like, what is it that holds the logos? Right in dialogue, mm -hmm. and 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 this idea of what if it was a narrative, right? What if it was sunyata? And what what does that mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I just I just gave you about twenty years worth of things to say. Um, or, or respond to. <laughs> so I just thought I'd overwhelm you to start with. Yeah, that that, that was kind of overwhelming. <laughs> uh oh, you're um, like. <laughs> <laughs> but but I will I will try my best. Mm -hmm. For Nishitani, it is always like speak like uh, things speak their truth. Fix things speak their koto, or that their, their their logos in the primordial sense. Yeah. yeah. What we can't do anymore in kind of like our Descartian framework is that we can really listen to things or to, to use the Heideggerian word to, to, to see them as they are, mm. to see being as it is. Mm. Mm. That's what we have 
forgotten. That's science vergessenheit. Yeah. Forgetfulness of being. Um, now, if we, what we have now, this radical transcendence to the world, mm-hmm. where we can only see shadows, mm-hmm. we are only in the cave, so to say, then we, 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 we do reduce everything to us being in the cave. Yeah. That's why John Wakey always says he's a non-reductionist, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's always this, this play of interplay of, of concealing and unconcealing, right? Yeah. What you said before with vulnerability, I think was perfect because what is, what is if, if I reveal something of myself, mm. I'm making myself vulnerable. Mm. If a thing speaks to you, mm. it also makes itself vulnerable in a sense. Mm. Alefia Neshitani speaks mm. in the book, Religion Nothingness. Alefia also, or Alef, Alefia is, is, something is laid bare. Yeah. It has, it has thrown all, all shells huh. apart and it reveals itself to you just as it is. Um, so when Shitani talks about a thing in, in the mo- in shunyata, in, in emptiness, then he says it, it refuses all determination. Mm. What you don't, th- he says in an essay, not in the book, he says in an essay somewhere, um, mm. then you don't have to, you don't have to make it, nature, for example, purely mechanistic. But you also don't attribute a soul to them. You just let them be as they are. Right. Right. For Heidegger, Heidegger says in, a, in an essay on, he talks about in a, in a seminar, he talks about Parmenides. He says, Denken und Sein or um, Vernehmen und Anwesen sind dasselbe. So thinking and being are the same. That's a very famous quote from Parmenides, yeah. right? But yeah. Um, Heidegger reminds us that even what we say thinking and being or conceptualizing the word concept right the Greeks didn't have concepts that that means when they 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 didn't grasp something in that sense Uh, what we are doing with our thinking is we grasp something so concept means to capture something yeah the Greeks didn't do that um oh so Wow, interesting. Okay, yeah, keep going. For Neiman, for Neiman, for, for Heidegger, is just we, we see a thing yeah. as it is. We see a tree yeah. as, it, as it is. Right. And Ivo, Ivo de Gennaro talks similarly in, in his latest dialogue with Johannes, right? The last one? And, and the la- the exactly. Last one. Man, that one was, boy. That, that was, was difficult, one, right? That one was dark. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> no, I loved it too. Yeah, I, I was really, I was really fascinated by it. But, but this was, it was also there was this kind of like unhomely feeling I, I got. Yeah. Um, because what he says is true that that philosophy was always like keeping an access to being, mm. and we we are in danger mm. of destroying this access to being. Yeah. So what Nishitani is doing is trying to give us how, how in Japan that, or in the East, how, let's say, the access to being was preserved mm. within emptiness. Yeah. Because, because for Nishitani, it was always, for, for him, the, 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 the historical um, era or epoch we are now in is like one of relative nothingness. So it's like, it's like and, and for him, that the step towards emptiness would then be absolute nothingness. Mm. So relative nothingness just nothingness just means it's 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 in so like it's either you you're just thinking of yourself as a living being and nature is dead. Yeah. Or then you have you you or you you're interpreting the the nothing as truly nothing. Yeah. Just as we did in the West. Yeah. So and and for Nishitani that that's really, I think, the, one of the main aims of his book, yeah. that we, we, we try to f- rethink 
of all of these questions and make a step towards absolute emptiness yeah or absolute nothingness yeah I thought. um and i think going back to scole that we kind of need ritual play and practices so that we can learn to interact with things in the proper sense yeah again and can see how their being shines through them right right you know i want to read right now i'm with with chris i'm reading um the, on the way to language we're going through uh chris and i are going through the the dialogue between um the japanese student i th i think it's nishitani right a student of nishitani talking with heidegger it's no, it's um, it's his name is Tezuka Tomio. He was a German study scholar from Japan. Oh, okay. Uh, um, and he was, a, I think, a professor. Um, okay. It's it's He's Nishitani quite, was. Quite Nishitani was started, yeah, Nishitani studied in the thirties in 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 Freiburg. Ah, oh, okay. I don't know if it came later to Germany again. I think so, yeah. but not so, not just for a short time. Yeah. I, there's this one, so there's this one line here that basically there's two, I'll read the, the, the Japanese philosopher says, and this is, this is, this is, I think starts to open up something like emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. In the dialogue, right? In the, in what the dialogue reveals and what allows the dialogue to be in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a Japanese person says, we Japanese do not think it strange that if a dialogue leaves undefined what is really intended or even restores it back to the keeping of the undefinable. So just pause right there. So like, so just a everyone listening, just like imagine like the, the like a dialogue with your mother. How does that go, right? Like, like do you have the experience, right, of of with your mother, with me and mom, when we talk, we do not think it's strange <laughs> if we'll, basically what we're talking about um, leaves itself undefined. Mm -hmm. um, what was really intended and even restores it back to the keeping of the undefinable. Like it, so, so in one of the things is, I think one of this, uh, and I say that because it, it highlights, I think what Heidegger is getting at with idle talk, right? And inauthentic, right? His, his notions of inauthenticity. Now, again, I don't want to like put a moral spin on that because we don't want to be authentic all the time. It, that would just be hell. You couldn't have anything sustain <laughs> itself unless you had something idling, right? And keeping the current interpretations up. And that's what a lot of most dialogues and they ought to be, right? Which are these kind of things where you talk to your neighbor, you say, hey, and you have this gossip thing. And there's all that idling is, is I, I think about that. I, I always have imagined inauthentic, idleness is the way that the, the cultural intelligibility basically keeps itself going like foliage, right? It's like this sense of like foliage it doesn't go very high, but it just keeps a uniform kind of sense of foliage or covering. And then, and then what authenticity is, I often think about is it springing forth up out of the foliage, right? And it like, all the foliage made it possible that for mm -hmm. some reason something came together a question and then something sprouts and then that sprout creates like 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 you could say draws forth a new intelligent sense of intelligibility that comes back down into the foliage that alters the conversation disrupts and alters the conversation right it's like the way the logos works somehow there 
so it's like i don't i want to like emphasize like it's not like you shouldn't have idle talk. You, you have to right but then there's authenticity mm -hmm. right so this is i think what we're talking about maybe maybe philosophical dialogue is something like authentic speech right authentic discourse mm -hmm. i don't know if that totally parallels it or not anything you wanted to say about that before i read read the final thing no no go ahead okay and he says then the heidegger says that is part i believe of every dialogue that has turned out well between thinking beings mm. as if of its own accord it can take care that that undefinable something not only does not slip away but displays its gathering force ever more luminously in the course of the dialogue right mm -hmm. i'll just read that part one more time that is part i believe of every dialogue that is turned out well between thinking beings as of its own accord it can take care that that undefinable something not only does not slip away, but displays its gathering force ever more luminously in the course of the dialogue. Hmm. So like thinking about the sense of emptiness, like sunyata, right? And the sense of undefinable, and then restore it back to the keeping of the un undefinable. And this, this, this role of thinking that doesn't conceptualize yeah. right? that that's like like every dog is turned out well between thinking beings of a of its own accord it can take care that the undefinable something right does not only does not slip away but this so that undefined like that unconceptual undefinable something does not only slip away, but the thinking somehow keeps it in the course of the dialogue, right? Mm. And it can display, right? It, it, it's that undefinable something not only does not slip away, but displays its gathering force. So there's a force mm. ever more luminously in the course of the dialogue. When I hear that, it's kind of like you, you're just seeing your, your partner with whom you're talking. And you do not impose any, anything on them. Yeah. You do not impose any proposition on them. Yeah. You, just, you just see them as they are in their presence, in their full presence. Yeah. And that's and and beyond that, let's say is a, is our being in a sense. But that's in always inexhaustible and and in that sense ineffable, undefinable. Mm. And when we come together and we, we are just dancing with our words in language, then and we do this in good faith and and in trust, I think. So I, I trust you also that you're doing the same thing. Yeah. Then 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 we are also making us vulnerable, I think. And then something can reveal, then something can reveal itself. Then something can light up out of that dance, so to say. And and that's, I think, then, then you, you're speaking your koto or, or your, your logos, your logos being, so to say, and I'm speaking my koto. Uh. And we, we can see it together. And then, then something happens. And that's the event. Then something happens. And then, then something new is born out of that. And, and that's the, 
that's we are participating in the unfolding creation of the world. And that's the worlding of the world. Um, and yet this undefinable, ineffable something that looms in the background, we have to be, if, if we do thinking right, then we can notice it, I think. Yeah. That there's something that we cannot describe or define yeah. that's in the background, supporting us. Ah, uh, and that begins that, that, okay, yeah. Okay, this is, okay, this is, a, this, is this, myster this mystery that I feel that's is accountable <laughs> for everything good that I call good in my life, right? Mm. Is it, 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 it comes from whatever this, this thing is that we're talking about. Okay, basically what I heard you say, right? Is you're like, like look, basically there's a vulnerability, right? And a trust that you're coming from good faith and I'm coming from good faith. And what I'm, mm. what I'm, what I'm bringing in my vulnerability is my, like you could say, there's, there's big L logos and then there's little L logos, right? There's like, there's my personal logos, right? The way the logos weaves my personhood and my personal intelligibility of things. So there's yeah. a way where I'm bringing in good faith, right? And trusting you to do the same the particular way that logos gathers itself in the world and you do the same, right? And because we're not, if it's really, it's, if it's really, if there's a respectful sense or humility, right? Um, a real thinking can emerge that isn't a grasping. But in some yeah. sense, it's a, it's a, we both begin to become transparent to something that we can't grasp. Yet it, it makes itself known in the course of the dialogue, right? Mm. It gathers itself in the course of the dialogue. So in some sense, the ungraspable, the undefinable does not only slip away, but it, it makes itself luminous it gathers itself and i would say that it gathers us right mm. so there's and i'm thinking about and it, it is, well there's this one point i want to make about uh, uh, aids i'll put this one on pause for a second about Her heraclitus in a, in a in a fragment of his but that whatever that thing is that gathers itself that doesn't have a name or a word or a concept but it's luminous that and you look towards it and it becomes present i've always wondered about because my life has been a series of being seized by things <laughs> that like some horizon opens up and i turn towards it and I go to look what that horizon is because it's pulling me forward. And then the next 20 years, my face gets formed by its revealment to me, right? And I look back and there's a weave of, there's a language pattern and there's movements and social discourses and all kinds of shit that you can define and get certifications in. At least mm -hmm. that's been my experience. But the question I have is how, did, how do I know to be interested and be seized by something if I don't know, by definition, I don't know what it is. What is that, what is that moment of what's, basically what's being unconcealed is concealment. It's like, it's actually being revealed that it's concealed, right? Mm. But there's something, how the fuck do I know how to be interested in something without already understanding it enough to be interested in by that this is this is a real mystery to me and I, i'm not asking you to solve it because i think if i if you i'm, solve, I'm I'd okay be disappointed. <laughs> yesterday we yesterday we talked in in johannes's course about yeah. amafati right yeah um and one one insight i got from heidegger is that whatever you are mm -hmm. 
you're, you, you, you're a happening to yourself. It's not that you emerge, you, you don't, it's not that you come out of your bond and say, I'm Guy, I'm here now, and I'm, I'm thinking now. It's not that way. It's like you, you gradually become aware of this human being that is you. You happen to yourself. In, in some sense, I'm off fun. So, so in your Dasein, there's something imposed onto you. Yeah. That's, that's your Fatum. That's your Geschick. That's your fate, so to say. And you can't change really who you are or what you are. Yeah. You can just, you happen to yourself, you're thrown into the world, and then in some sense, you, you have to live with it. Yeah. And that's, in some sense, that's, that's your suchness. Yeah. And that, that has something divine to it. Yeah. And that's more like our drive that always that we always want to find out who we are and who we are and, and, and what, what, what are we going to do and what are we up to, right? right. And I mean, in Buddhism, that, that's this monkey mind, right? Mm. We always think, of, think about ourselves, mm. but there's this essential non-ego mm. that we are. So we happen to ourselves and a, a sense of a certain fate is imposed to our data. Yeah. What we can do is that we, we, we have love into that, what we are. Yeah. Whatever it is doing, it's an, it's an unfolding process and we can decide if we want to contribute and participate in the unfolding of ourselves. That's Amor Fati, I think. Um, yeah. Translate Amor Fati again, just so for, for people, like, what's the, tra- what's the Amor Fati's, Amor Fati's Nietzsche's um, concept of l- loving your faith. But Johannes would say it's also a love of necessity. Yeah. Love of, uh, and it's, it's, there's an essential knowing of. I would I would call it with Nishitani knowing of non-knowing, knowing what is right for oneself, yeah. knowing what it, knowing what. And it's it, it's so strange to talk about it, right? Because we 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 always start from our ego in a sense when we think about what are we drawn to, yeah. and it's this mystery, right? It's 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 really it's a mystery. But for me, it's like even this happening to oneself, yeah. that this thrown, this being thrown into the world. I mean, that that's that. Of course, that's a great mystery. Yeah. Um, and yet, just when when you can feel the light and the love and the beautiful moments in life, and how how things can shine forth. Right. Um, that that's all compensation and the consolation for all the suffering i think yeah and, and in buddhism there's a lot of i think we have to really understand this that in yeah. buddhism it's most of the suffering is just because of our centeredness on ourselves mm, right. and for them this self-centeredness is 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 I mean, Nishitani writes this somewhere in the book. It's it's so deep. It goes to, into the roots of our being. Yeah. Deep, deep into our roots of in the, into the roots of our being. And we can feel this when we have some drives, right? Yeah. Stronger drives for sexuality or, or drives for food and, and lust and, and um, they are really deep in our being. We can't really can't do anything about that. Right. Um, and in Buddhism, it's just you, you see them and you, you try to make the best out of them. Yeah, and that's a, that's a simple explanation. But right. again, we, we happen to ourselves. There's there's always this yeah. essential, really true, non quality of the non ego to to our lives. Totally. And wouldn't you say too that? And this has been my this has been my experience 
it, especially like in, it's funny in the emerging of circling has also been simultaneously the the it's like in the realizing of circling who also got realized and that was guy right mm. like i have a completely different understanding of who i am through circling and it being developed it's fractal that way and i and i and i think that there's this quality of i think this is what they mean by the notion of sovereignty right John calls it the, like the agent arena relationship. And I, and I think, I think what John means by that is this, it's the agent arena relationship is the basic, um, what you find yourself already being in the world thrown into, mm. it is kind of structured as an agent arena relationship. And that what I like about thinking about it like that is it, is it starts to give access to that finding out who you are is is mutually both faces get found out the face of the world and the face of yourself right and that the optimal place to be right in those 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 moments were like 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 it's the suchness and the inexhaustible co-reveal themselves like flow states oftentimes mm -hmm. i think exemplify that and i think what that is is that it's that experience of like what you're pressing into right and it's pressing back like back onto you is mutually as a reciprocal opening right yeah where it's the face of the world is articulating in the moment that it's drawing out an aspect of me that maybe i don't i've never seen before thus revealing before the world and then and then temporality just well, time disappears and an, an ecstatic mm. temporality happens, right? That sweet spot seems to be, you can't, it's like, you can't, you can't, it's impossible not to like fucking think that that's the most beautiful thing in the world. It just seems part of the experience. It's like the place of wonder and mm. deep involvement. So there's this kind of quality of, of, and I'm wondering about this, right? I'm wondering about this. So, And you you mentioned it you mentioned a number a number of times like love right like and you also you also in this last time is what I really got from you in this uh, what emerged for me right out of the last conversation I realized was when you when you I think you leaned in and you're like we were talking about basically how fucked it was right and like how do you how do you be with this fuck it just seems like it's just gonna go over a cliff right and you're like. <laughs> And I think I said something like, yeah, but I think, what is it? How come I'm not totally in despair personally, essentially? I'm like, what? And I think it has something to do with if I can begin to understand it, I start, uh, there's a releasement there in the fact of it, it being intelligible. It's like that it's intelligible, no matter what the shape of the content of it is, right? It could be the most tragic thing in the world. But if, if I can grasp or, or reveal its intelligibility, right? That in itself, and then I think you leaned in and you said like, yeah, I, 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 I think it's just good. You can, there's a, tr and then you use the word trusting the world. And that I had never quite thought about. And I think, I think the reason why it, it really struck me is when you said it, is that I think it actually, and this is oftentimes what I notice, it actually unconcealed something that was on some level already true, but concealed to me, right? Those are the things that seem to be most impactful, right? That kind of insightfulness. And I think when you brought in trust, I was like, that's really it. It's like if as long as as long as there's intelligibility, right? And I, I can be co-revealed with it on some level. There's an ecstasis that um mm. that gives me some, I don't know, some place to stand, right? Whether it's a heaven or the heaven or hell, there's some place to stand here that's Mm. has dignity and 
but so so there's so there's that there's that part and then i heard you mention just a number of times just love i really kind of and i think i really i, I have to say I, I really kind of get that about you like you're here talking about this stuff I, and i'll ask you i i don't know if it's just a projection of mine but it seems like all those books back there right like t trying to get the the, the, the hulky um guild to meditate and making videos to help them meditate right like that you're on this conversation right that you're you kind of go like this and you think and writing things down it it strikes me that what what that is is it seems like you're you're loving is mm. does that feel true it, it I mean, yes. I mean, trust and love are in some sense deeply connected with each other, right? Yeah. And it's of course, it's 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 this love to build personhood. John Mulvaney talks about that's the highest form of love, right? Mm -hmm. To build personhood. It. Yeah. To build agency. Yeah. And with, with the trust thing, I mean, I did not come. To the, to the last conversation with in mind, I want to talk about trust, <laughs> but it was born out. Yes. It, it sprang forth yes. out of our dialogue. Yeah. And, and it came out of this gathering in, in German. It's maybe interesting. German Gespräch, conversation. Yeah. It has this G, this, this prefix G, what, what Heidegger uses also in Gestell, right? Yeah. And this G just indicates this gathering. Yeah. That's why the build of being is this, cons this, this gathering of consumer. Yeah. Um, but Gebirge is this mountain range. And the mountain range is just, you have one mountain, mm. and then you have a lot of mountains. Mm. And I heard this, that's, that's a Gebirge. That's a gathering of mountains. Right. And... I heard this in a Zen talk, in a sense, um, when you have a Gebirge, when you have a mountain range, um, and you see that the ring, that there's a ring to it, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this mountain range is the gathering of mountains. But I heard in a Zen verse somewhere that this ring feels like it's inexhaustible. Because mm. it, it stretches outward and you can't count the mountains. They are, this inexhaustibility then is gathered together. Uh, it's in the gathering together, it, is, that the, yes. is that suchness? That, that when it gathers into a, a sense of unity of all the mm. infinite multiplicity. Mm. That's maybe also why we talked in a lot of, of being. Yeah. That there's this yeah. something that all mountains have in common. Yeah. Um, Gespräch, again, conversation, means gathering of language. Yeah. So, so we are gathering this together with something like love or trust. Yeah. And then something arises out of it. Right. And again, I, I did this was happening just because we were coming together in, in our and, and dialogue is, is something like a place or arena that where, where and that's I think also with circling or, or, or with meditation sanghas. Yeah. You have to create a space where you can protect your suchnesses of each individual human being that comes there yeah and that there's always you have you have to involve trust in that i think right um and, and then something can arise yeah in what and, 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 yeah. and the, the interesting thing is i think and that's that's why I said I sent you in this email with the tea ceremony. So there's this proverb, Ichigo Ichie. So which means one one time, one happening. Oh. Um, and it, it just 
it just wants to remind you that it, every moment in that sense is precious mm -hmm. and it carries a freshness a newness with it yeah but ultimately it also goes away and, and you're you're kind of like aware of that when you gather together mm -hmm. in the tea ceremony because the people who will gather together are always different and that means there will always something and, and, and not just the people but also like tea bowls you use the tea you use mm. the, the weather that's outside mm. like the circumstances where you come together are always different yeah and then then different things light up yeah and that's that's why it's always inexhaustible i think right because in, in each circling moment you can even even when you circle around the same person different facets of their personhood will light up right right and just when you drink tea different different facets of the tea will light up for you so that's mm. the taste the color of the tea um how you feel after drinking the tea Right. Um, and, and so, so, and, and, yeah, I think we, and Skole, or Skole is something like this shared place or pl placing, so, so to say. Is Skole where we can, thing that translates into idleness? Yes, leisure, idleness, yeah. Muse in German. Um, and, and that's this placing, this creating a place where all of these things can even arise. Right. And, and, and precisely it, that, and just tell me if I'm on the, on, if I'm following you here. And, and it's the space, Skole is the space in which that which is can arise in its discontingency, right? That mm. this contingent see of its self arising beingness, right, can shine forth, right, and become flagrant in a sense. I'm using Evo de Janeiro's book. By the way, I think, I think that guy, he, he just, I, you read, I, I, I've, <laughs> I, I just got to say, whatever that thing is that Heidegger does where like you get done with the end of that sentence and then your life's never the same, <laughs> right? Mm. Like Ijo e e Di Venero, he's got, he really has that particular way of doing it where this, like just this, okay, like a book, this little red book called Principles of Philosophy. You're like, well, maybe I could like bear like a few moments of this kind of principle. But then you read it and your whole thing all your presuppositions have just turned inside out and he's just like unassuming about it. Right. But just mm. looking at the phenomena. So what it thinks he talks a lot about is that what he, the way that he translates, so he translates some um, Aletheia, not as unconcealment, but as, um, as disabscondedness. Right. And I think that the, the, the understanding that I have is like where he says the problem with with looking at the 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 Aletheia as unconcealment is that it implies something that's concealed. Mm. But disabscondedness, you get more of a sense of it's like from the very center of its being, right? what it is mm. is revealing it's not something that's hidden then you unhide it it from it being is revealed and i'm wondering if this tea ceremony <laughs> yes that's, that's wow that, that's great good no no heidegger somewhere talks about the heart of alifia yeah alifia however we want to pronounce it so there's a heart somewhere mm. and and nishitani also talks about the kokoro of something mm. that there's this heart inside of something mm -hmm. and that's this that's this center that's radiating out so to say yeah 
that we can we can feel or see or yeah. and and for Nishitani then that would be he talks about this he says kokoro eru is is um um not is is like what um it's like it's like attaining your heart attaining the heart of something mm. um mm. so attaining a center that is ra- radiating outward mm. maybe let's put it that way yeah um what did I want to say? Josef Pieper, the German philosopher that Johannes had mentioned in the idleness course, said something like, so idleness or muse is to time what is the temple for space. So say it, one, it's one, this, one more time. Just say that one more time. I want to make sure I get idleness, it. Idleness or muse is to time huh? what is the temple to space. Okay. Okay. Oh, nice. It's, it's, it's making time mm. so so idleness is making time free of whatever we are doing it's making it free of our planning for constraining and we just make it open so to say yeah, yeah. and it's 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 in that sense it like all the previous cultures had had kind of like a feeling for that that this was necessary yeah that you have you have sites and let's say cycles in Mm. the year where we are engaging in what we call this musa yeah so we have both both sites and times for something that that's why that's that's i think why these all, all cultures have something like repeated festivals in a year that were not about binge drinking but right. about something more yeah right yeah um something like genuine idleness yeah. genuine rituals yeah Gen- so genuine genuine play so to say serious play as john and yeah. would say yeah um um Hmm. And tea ceremony, I think, is in kinds of it's an instantiation, a manifestation of that. It's a, it's a some somehow sacred place with a time mm-hmm. when it's appropriate to do a tea ceremony. Yeah. To where we can just we can play seriously. Yeah. And in out of that serious play, out of this really scholar so to say something emerges yeah and and this is this maybe this heart that we can there's this heidegger calls it um, with parmenides it's like the untrembling heart of aletheia he says Untram- so aletheia has an untrembling heart untrembling heart of aletheia yeah yes that's in the that's in the zeringen seminar from 1974 Oh wow, he's he's almost older than dirt by that point. <laughs> no, I think yeah, it's it, yeah, it's very late. Um, yeah. and that's from Parmenides. Yeah. So he says, Alephea has an untrembling heart. Yeah, and that's I think that re- that's what came to my mind when you were talking about yeah. um the book from Evil Virginal. Right. So I don't know how to translate it in, in, into German. So I'm a little bit, I, a little bit um, lost with the term disabscondedness. Yeah. Because I've I've not heard it and not uh, really used okay. it in my in my English conversations. It's in it's in uh, it's in the English, mm. it's in the English of uh, the principles of philosophy. Mm. He goes into that. No, I mean, yeah. I can't really imagine anything <laughs> with the term. Yeah. It, That's uh, kind of like the, it's like you could say, it, it, it's just the sense of like, yeah, it's the untrembling heart or the, like the self um, from the inside out, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's 
disabscondedness, right? Where it's still, and, it, and, here's the, and here's the thing that I really appreciate that Heidegger continually, his whole life kind of was constantly working with this, this sense in which beings, disclosure and concealment, right? That, and, and that, you know, so much of, so much of, I mean, it's become like, we, we enact, we don't have metaphysics anymore in the traditional sense because we're enacting it fully, right? Like, and this is one of the things, this is one of the things that I think has it make sense that we do these kinds of converse, these, these dialogues and, and we put them out, right? And invite other people to, 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 to listen to them, right? Is I think precisely the why did you, know, you have to ask our question ourselves that question? Well, why does that make sense, right? What what's why is that intelligible to like have these obscure fucking conversations where probably the majority of the people in the world wouldn't even be able to register, right? <laughs> they don't even they won't even be able to kind of like register what they don't understand. It's just it's just. It's just but a very few people will, right? And we still, we still put them out as videos. It's like, what is the, what's the talos of that, right? I feel for me, you know, I, it's actually, I don't know if I feel this, I wonder um, if in some sense, right? What this is, in some sense, if, if, if reality was like a, was like a field and we say that we say that gestell right or in framing right is just weaving deeply in the whole thing there's little places where it's still scully still can happen right there's little little weaves where it can still happen and i think mm -hmm. these conversations part mm -hmm. of their talos is, is that we're like wait no there's a there's, there's very few places where you could still have God seizures, as I, I, I like to call them. I think one is, is an interpersonal relationship. I think that's a place where we can actually reach being, no matter what people believe or their presuppositions, right? Intimacy is one of those things that if you find yourself having it, it's, you, you, it's, a, it's a, an experience of transcendence, right? That's still available, right? It's undeniable without needing to believe anything right mm -hmm. and i and i and i think that there's something about a philosophical intimacy because because for example like at one point as you were talking right it's strangely personal like we're not talking about like we're not talking about the details of each other's lives we're not like spilling our personal guts we're not telling personal secrets to each other this it's not we're not we're not disclosing necessarily interpersonal things about each other's lives necessarily rather we're sharing our life right now right mm. and and we're talking about these these things opening up and i had this moment where i was just like listening to you talk right and i was just like you're like my new best friend <laughs> i just had the feeling of affinity right like for mm. like this i love this guy this is like th just this this unreasonable affinity opens up. And, and I think it's not, what, what would it mean to you if I just spill out personal facts of my life? Yeah. It's more about in the enactment, yeah. in this imperse, kind of impersonal enactment, yeah. you, you see much more about me, right? Yeah. yeah. And if I say, if I tell you now where I yeah. lived and where I went to school or so. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. And it, well, it's just in this, yeah. In this, how, how we come together and dialoguing together. Yeah. And and why why do you have, why can you have some sometimes deep affinities with someone although you just you just met them because your being shines through and your being in a sense is is your or your suchness. Yeah. I mean, it will transform, but in some sense, there's this likeness to it. Yeah. What, what Johannes is, I think, about with the eternal recurrence of the like, 
Mm. And Nishitani talks about the likeness as well. In, in, mm. There's a likeness to a bird. There's a likeness to a tree. Yeah. And, and in being, I think there's there's a likeness, and, and we can see the likeness if 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 we yeah. if we can think in this in the way Heidegger wants us to think in this contemplative or what he calls the besinnliche Denken. The comp con contemplative thinking where I just can see you yeah. without putting anything of my stuff onto you. Right. And that's, that's maybe to make this a little bit more concrete for the people who are listening. That's, for example, by the, the, the filmmaker Terence Malick, who, who was very influenced by Heidegger, yeah. chose to make films. Because when you watch a f and 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 so to say, he wanted to to give the the one who is viewing the movie a perspective from which Heidegger views the world, as he understood Heidegger. And I think he does a great job with that. But why a movie? Because a movie always draws you out of yourself and yeah. lets you forget about your ego for yeah. for a while. Yeah. That that's why that's why movies are, can can be so transformative and so powerful yeah yeah and that's that's the way how we have to go in a conversation we forget we we, we let our stuff so to say behind yeah and just come in with our our being yeah and then then th this likeness reveals itself to you and although we haven't talked for long with each other mm -hmm. you can see the likeness yes. and then you can feel the affinity yeah in the and, but, but well again that's so precious that's why we shouldn't talk about it that's why it's it's lurking what what the japanese scholar says right it's in the background where it's safeguarded we don't talk about it and put it too much out because it's it's so precious in that sense yes yes and and if if you can if you can think and listen carefully, then you can see it anyways. Without that, we explicitly yes. You broke up just for a second. You said if you can think and listen carefully, yeah. then it, it's there, and and we don't have to talk about it explicitly. Yeah. To think, okay, so to think and listen carefully. Those three things just seem, I wanna, I wanna just, I wanna pause on those for a second. So, so essentially what you were talking about or what we're talking about is, you know, what are the, oh, there's a bunch of different threads that are emerging, right? But what is this, you know, it's, there's this question, what is this connection between, say, dialogue, you know, and in this sense, philosophical dialogue, dialogos, mm. um, to have it arise, the space of it or what it's inside of that makes it possible? What is it if it's narrative? And what if it, if we say it's emptiness, right? What's the difference between those two things, right? A narrative, I'm gonna propose something like this, mm -hmm. right? Most, I think most conversations are already trying to get somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Or there's mm -hmm. the idleness sense. There, it's like, it's a narrative that we're all sharing and we're just regurgitating it to each other right, for mm. that kind of thing. What is it, what is it for dialogue, right, to be on its home ground, of, as, as Nishitani would say, I love that term, it's on its own home ground of emptiness. And then mm. you said, you no, know, as I talked to myself, as I just kind of represented that, I just remembered just what you said about how, where the Japanese are like, don't talk about it too much, it's too precious. It's interesting because a diet, like as, as Nishitani 
you know, in many, in many ways, I think that Nishitani was like, how could I get these Westerners to like get, get a glimpse of emptiness? Mm. Right. And he just, he goes through it over and over and over and over again. At one level, it's a little bit repetitive, but it, it's, it's precisely because you can't explain it. You can only see it. And there's these moments where I'm like, whoa, the, it's a, it's not a thought. It's a, mm. it's a, a realizing something that's like so close to you. It's closer to you than yourself, right? Emptiness. But one of the ways he goes and describes it is like the fire, right? We can describe the being of the fire as in all of its attributes as like ignition, right? Heat, consumption, all that kind of stuff, right? And he says, mm -hmm. yet the fire in, does not burn itself, right? Mm -hmm. And it's precisely in that it doesn't burn itself that it has its being, right? If it burnt itself, it wouldn't be fire. Its own home ground mm -hmm. is already is in some sense its own negation of itself. So, mm -hmm. and that it's and that it's not back here, mm -hmm. and then it, it, it negates itself and therefore it's fire. I get the sense that no, the self negation is within its the very heart of its being. It's in every molecule. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. go away such that the fire fills it in and it disappears. It's the possibility or the openness for it to be the particular thing it is from its own home ground. So it's interesting because I think about this and you, you mentioned this sense of like, yeah, we shouldn't talk about it so explicitly, right? The dialogue, right? Or, the, or in the tea ceremony because it's so precious. Well, what is a precious preserving, right? It's connected with, I think precious is probably connected with preservation, preserving, sustaining. Yeah, I just kind of, like I kind of hit the edge of my intelligibility there. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was waiting for the climax. <laughs> right, totally. Well, you just told me not to say it, so I. <laughs> oh, what? Now it's now it's now it's now it, now, it, now it's harbored in the background again. <laughs> right, totally, totally. Well, it's the, it's precisely the generosity, right, that opens up in these kinds of conversation it's enormously generative right mm -hmm. the feelings are genera generative the connections are generative like the the fire and the transcendence is generative it's luminous right mm -hmm. and i would say that in some sense there's that and, and this goes back i think to nishitani's teacher I think the, the first Kyoto philosopher, what was his name? He was, he was really into kind of the Hegelian di dialectic. Nishita. 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 He talked a lot Nishita, about, yeah. yes, he talked a lot about um, the dialectic of self-negation, right? And connected that with, with, with nothingness. In some sense, like that all, like there's something that withdraws that makes, makes all of this possible. And, and basically mm -hmm. what I hear in, by not making it so explicit, right? You're preserving it in its proper place of withdrawal because it's what's making all of this possible on some level. That I think that's what mm -hmm. I started, I was, I was trying to get at there. It, 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 it's similar to, to this idea of, of how Anishitani thinks about a thing on the field yeah, absolute nothingness or shunyata, which yeah. is again, it he says it refuses all determinations. Yeah, which means what I said in the beginning. He says it gives an example. He says there the fire. Let's say the fire is in its home ground. Yeah, but that home ground in some sense is it's just the fire is as it is. And he says, but what we, we are always doing is that we want to make things explicit, right? That we want to attribute all sorts of things to the fire, right. giving them its substance, yeah. saying fire is this and this and that and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. He says, no, on the, on the field of emptiness, it refuses all determinations. Mm. And 
does it it's it's there in its fireness or firehood or I don't know how to talk about it, but we we have to just let it be, so to say. And that's that's why we shouldn't make make it then too explicit. Right. Cool. Then then I think there's there's also there comes then being into place. Because then, then something like the, the the being of the fire can yeah. come to the fore, come to the fore. Right. But you you said something. I think this idea of self-negation is also very. That that's why I can, that this kenotic movement what is so important for Nishitan. This self-emptying. Yeah. And in some sense. If if I want to let your being shine, think of interest shine into my being, mm. then I have to be willing to negate something in me. Mm. So I'm open and receptive for what you are saying. Yeah. And vice versa. Interesting. So so that's why this self-negation is so important. Oh, it's really it's about, I, yeah. Yeah, and it's not it's not it's not negation again not not in this nihilistic sense, right. but it's it's just self emptying. Yeah, and that's it's it's an, it's this maybe we can talk with gelassenheit with releasement about it. It's not I'm not I'm not letting go of everything, but um, it's an active let, letting go. My suchness is still there, and yet I'm. I'm open for what you are saying and bring yeah. it into the dialogue. Right. That's why Nishitani uses these, these, I think that these, these um I see the you, so to say, you see the I or, or form see the emptiness, emptiness see the form. Right. Because the other, the other always shines into you, and you shine into the other. And that's this, that's this I think paradoxical coming together then of, of yeah. things where they, they are both they are both in their suchness and yet they are open to something else yeah and that's where it's very hard for us to talk about this if we just in in substance thinking but then because then there's me and there's you and there's no coming together really yeah yeah but that's not what nishitani is talking about and i think that's that's also like in, in, in something like love, or again, trust, there's also, I think, this movement of self-emptying. Yeah. Otherwise, these things cannot arise, I think. Yeah. Self-emptying. You, you just, mm. you, you, made a, um, you made a link, right, to, for you to come into appearance in the full sense of the word, in some sense, you come into full appearance through my night or my own self-negation, right? Or self-empty. Mm. You come into to appearance. And now that now we're starting to get into something that I am continually find so mysterious and so determinate in ways that are very difficult to talk about which is, has to do with touches on listening, right? And in the sense of, you know, the, the Greek sense of hearkening, right? Which mm. has to do with my understanding of the original sense of hearkening, which is connected to hearing and listening, right? Is where that word comes from. Mm. Originally was a kind of total obedience like a, almost like a spiritual obedience right and i it's interesting to hear it in terms of self-emptying as a kind of obedience because it's interesting people usually think about that's a really charged word because usually people think about enforced obedience right mm. but actually the um volunteer obedience is very difficult to do, right? Precisely mm -hmm. for the reason why I think you're talking about, it's like, we don't, <laughs> we happen to ourselves, right? 
<laughs> right? Yeah. The quality of like, <laughs> you know, I, I just can't, I, I can't enslave myself. I can't just tell myself what to do and then do it, right? It's, there's something else going on here that's not totally transparent. So to, to, to and so if listening at the deepest sense of the words has to do with obedience, I, I'm, I'm starting to hear something new about that through what we're talking about, right? Which is like, oh, uh, obedience is a certain sense of like, to hear you is to obey in the full precise suchness of emptying, right? Mm. In exactly the same, you say, shape, of what you just said, right? <laughs> it's like to really hearken, to really hear. It's really interesting to think about that is it's the obedience, the hearkening is, is to really let happen my own emptying precisely in the shape that you actually take for you to become mm. in that moment to me. Because I've always wondered about, because I feel like doing circling all these years what has been the most personally transforming for me has, has been simply about learning how to listen, like really listen, yeah. right? And there's something about what it, it's, I've just noticed like my, like in my own, from my own personal development standpoint, it's like, there seems to be a one-to-one -one relationship with like my own, you could say, existential psychological depth and development mm. and what I'm able to hear, right? How deeply I can hear, like, can I hear the, the silent thing that you're not saying, right? As time has gone on, my ability to listen, right? In a deep sense has been synonymous with like, like you could say my own evolution as a person, right? So I'm just, all those things are starting to kind of come together as you're talking about that. Mm. Nishitani says, mm -hmm. quoting Basho, right? Learn from the pine tree, the koto of the pine tree, and learn the koto, learn from the bamboo, the koto of the bamboo. And again, koto is like logos. It's this, this being that, that speaks forth from our depths. Yeah. Okay. And that there is a quality of listening in, in this deep participatory knowing. Yeah. You, 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 you can listen to the koto of the bamboo, the pine tree, or of, let's say, another person. And the funny thing is, when we think of that, that's why, that's why Nishitani also talks in this ontological sense, I think. When we come to a thing which we think of like dead, right? But a thing that is self-emptying is not just we as human beings, but it's it's everything in sense in the world. Mm -hmm. So also like when you come to the pine tree and you want to learn from the pine tree, then even the pine tree self-empties itself and opens itself up to, for you. Mm. And that's, that's, I think, why emptiness is not just, it's not about just us human beings, yeah. but about all beings. Yeah. And, and that's then... That, that's I think why, why I sometimes have this this when this feeling of, of peace even when I see like a Japanese some, some of these Japanese gardeners for example I mean why do we have feel a feeling of, of deep rooted peace when you just see them how they interact with a, a tree for example or their yeah. temple garden yeah because I mean, if we if we would take our Descartesian stance like really serious, then this would make no sense. Why is he caring about these lifeless yeah. plants that are just governed by these cold natural laws? Yeah. But no, it's 
even the planet is self emptying itself even even there is a coming together be between the plant and you that's the same i think with persons mm. and and then then there's listening and nishitani talks about it in the book there's listening to the koto i will just look it up <laughs> oh yes <laughs> you listen to the koto of a thing um Uh, where is it? The pine speaks the koto of the pine tree. The bamboo, the koto of the bamboo. Mm. Our knowing rational order or logos always begins from and ends in the place where things speak of themselves, of themselves, of their own koto. Its point of departure is where things are on their own home ground, just as they are manifest in their suchness. Mm. For that things are as they really are, and that they speak of their own koto, are truly one and the same thing. And a little bit before he says, oh, I maybe should read all of this. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in brief, here logos or koto as rational order indicates the aboriginal mode of being of things on the very field where they are where they in fact are manifest in their aboriginality. In German, it would be Urständigkeit. Okay. And at the same time implies that this is the mode of being that these things ought aboriginally to show. Mm -hmm. That things are means aborigin aboriginally that they express themselves. Yeah. And that in expressing themselves, they give expression at the same time to what it is that makes them be pointing it out and bearing witness to it in the twofold sense of clarifying and confirming. Yes. This is what it is for things to be in a Dharma-like mode. The one aspect we refer to as things, things preaching the Dharma, the other as they're obeying its imperatives. Mm -hmm. So you've, the things are preaching the Dharma and we are in spiritual obedience, as you wonderfully said before, listening to what they preach. Yeah. Nishitani calls this, they are preaching their Dharma mode, yeah. their Dharma likeness also. It may sound strange. Okay, he says, both are one in the Dharma-like nature of existence. It may sound strange to say that, quote unquote, things preach the dharma or speak the logos but everything we know of rational order is from things it is what we hear from things all our knowledge springs from and returns to the place where in basho's words we should from the pine tree learn the koto of the pine tree and from the bamboo the koto of the bamboo one of my favorite passages in the in the religion of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that's that's this listening. Yes. Yeah. Things are preaching that dharma-like naturalness. Yes. And we are by self-emptying ourselves in a mode of spiritual obedience, listening to their koto or their logos. And that's how things are in a mode of emptiness. And that's what, what we have. That's the, 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 that's the place of aboriginality that we have to return to for Nishitani. Mm -hmm. Nishitani always says the nihilism of our modern age is something we have arrived at. Yeah. Again, with, 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 with Heidegger, it's the forgetfulness of being. We have forgotten these things and we have to return yeah. to a place where we can again participate in this deep participatory sense of knowing participate with things and, and listen to things and and be in spiritual obedience yes. of what they preach to us so that's the that's the logos or the cult of what they preach to us that was powerful <laughs> very powerful yes. It's like it was a I can feel the energy yeah, around us. <laughs> so much good emptiness. Thank you so much for sharing sharing 
such good nothing with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that, uh, no, it, that was really great. Um, yeah. And also, again, it, it can only come into being by like such suchness is coming together yeah that we as beings come together in a mode of trust and, and love and self-emptying in this deep religious sense yes. and only then this this the, it's the it's that we have the possibility that things open up right right and that the the, the divine logos or the koto yes. comes to the fore yes and that's that's also that's this preciousness yeah i think that's why we had always this sense of it, like making a temple and that's why idleness was always divine that's why we have the divine sunday where we have the time that's really safeguarded yes for going to the temple or right. the church right right and and we've forgotten mm. we've forgotten and we, we, we are, we can't listen anymore. And Nishitani has recognized this and tries to, yes, I think he, I think he tries to finish the product that the thing Nietzsche and Heidegger started. Yeah. And I, I think, I think he achieved it, but it's just too difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. I think, yeah. I think, I think I, I'm agreeing with John. I've, I've read the book the first time seven years ago and I didn't understand much of it. Yeah. I only only like the first chapters of the book. Yeah. But I, I I really had the feeling that there was a lot in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I really, I mean, I mean that it's also because Nishitani is so difficult because he, he, you need so much understanding also. To, you need yeah. Heidegger and you need Nietzsche and, and yeah. you need all of philosophy to, to get kind of like understand him. And how, however, it's really interesting because he's doing something, I, and I, I just want to commend this and underline this because this is actually kind of this this comes back to the role of philosophy as giving mm -hmm. access to the world, right, and the possible loss of that, right, and what that means. Because there's lots of people, well, at least in California, there's lots of people that are doing Zen, right, that are even reading Dashan, you know, his. And I always get this sense that like, if you try to take the English Cartesian presuppositions and then you read Zen, you don't really, you're not, it, it, it's it, most likely you're not actually um, really grokking it, right? Um, it's like a, in a certain sense, I think what ends up happening, at least what I see it with a lot of like meditators and stuff like that is um, this is why I really back, cause I used to really be into Buddhism or read a lot of Buddhism, right? When I was younger. And at some point I started to kind of get something, something's going astray here with this, right? It's something's being missed. And I just, I don't even think I thought that consciously but I think what's going on with a lot of a lot of some of the Eastern practices or the Eastern kinds of thinking in the West is it seems like people are unknowingly presupposing kind of a Cartesian subject that then they're trying to, um, in some sense, let go of, right? Like, but they, they have to posit it in order to let go of it. And they just end up in these very things that I don't like when I read Nishitani and, and these different things, I, I, did, I always got this sense they're not talking, but they're talking about something else. And I think, I think Nishitani is getting into the minutia of it, right? In such a way that you're actually, you got, you have to go back to those notions about substance and work through that thinking mm. that, that you you know because when you read about that stuff you're not reading something foreign you're actually ex explicating what the background is for everybody that's they step on onto that's what makes that's what makes philosophy i think I, I try to really communicate this with people because it's like philosophy isn't optional right in the sense of the world mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. have a view of the world if the view 
if the world occurs to you at all, right? The way that it occurs, how it occurs, what it is, all that stuff that just seems given, all of that, right, is all of these presuppositions, these pre-thematic history, historicity in us. And so Nishitani does a good job of like kind of going way underneath there, are all the notions about substance and like looking at them and questioning them. And, and he does it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. That's why I think it's a kind of therapy <laughs> mm. in a certain sense. But yeah, I agree. It's really good. It's really good talking with you, my friend. <laughs> no, I uh, was really a beautiful dialogue, really. Yes. You have a good day. Let's do this again. Sure. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a nice day. Thanks, you too.